All right, Isaac Beer. So it is time to get into the nitty gritty of the evolution of our universe as we know it. So this little uh, um, presentation PowerPoint is sort of our first major lecture of the year. And this I'm going to guide with some notes on the side here as I talk and also show you as many animations as I can as we kind of go through this. But let's dial into like what the Big Bang is actually saying. So it's really important to sort of look at it from a historical perspective as to sort of what has happened in science across the years. So if we talk antiquity, now antiquity, in case we're not familiar with that term, would be like our ancient societies, our Greeks, our Romans. I mean, you could really go further back into the Egyptians um, in Western civilization because you learn from a Western view, whether you realize it or not, had this idea of thought development and advancement of society. That's kind of what we're looking at. And so there's a lot that comes from Greece or comes from Rome um, or the Egyptians. And then you may think like, well, what happened after that? And honestly, the world was kind of in disarray. And so there's a couple pieces of information that sort of lead to sort of the decline in scientific development or not so much of the decline, but the loss of advancements and sort of the upfront uh, battles that were fought, many of which there are parallels to today. But even in our mathematics classes and our sciences today, there are several things we pull on from the ancient Greeks and Romans. And if we're thinking about that from almost a, a period of time, I would argue up until about the year 476, we're kind of still in antiquity because in 476, something really important happens. Rome falls. And when Rome falls, there's no unifying empire for the world of the Western view as we're concerned. That's the late or the last true great empire. And great, I mean large. I don't mean that it was good or bad or whatever it may be, but the last large empire. And so in the year 476, we enter what is now known as the Middle Ages. And the Middle Ages is a crazy time for a lot of reasons. Because there's no unifying empire, you have a really hard time passing down information um, from year to year. So it's almost like there's a constant battle or warfare where you can almost treat it as like Game of Thrones, but there's nothing cool about it. It's just the death, disease, and despair part that's happening. Throw in a little Black Death and a mini Ice Age, and well, not a lot could really happen. So in the time of desperation, when you don't have a, a, a large amount of information being passed from generation to generation, what happens is that the church fills that void for most of society, and that is the the information that's passed from year to year. Now, I'm not debating whether that's right or wrong. I'm just saying it is what happened. And so the church filling the void, now the intellectual doctrine that's being used is the Bible. And so the idea for life, for anyone living after the year 476, it's about survival. It's not about advancement. It's not about things that are going to be sort of fun. It's just, do I have food and do I have somewhere to be at this point? And I bring this into context because as we start looking closer at all this, you're going to realize what's strange is that the development of science it has a large gap in what's known as the Middle Ages. And the Middle Ages are surrounded with a lot of mysticism. And so it gets a little strange there. And then we hit the Renaissance. And the Renaissance is going to be our scientific revolution. That's the Protestant reform as well. You learn about this in European history. But from the years, you know, 1350 to, I would argue, about 1555, you've got crusades happening from Europe and Asia. So you start to develop a trade route. Um, Europe, it stops destroying itself and instead really focuses on destroying the Holy Land because they want to reclaim it. And that's a whole nother set of issues. But the roots of antiquity start to show up again. Now, there's some problems with that because if the church is the dominating power factor in this, then the leader of the church is almost a king, uh, almost the new emperor. And so the pope becomes extremely powerful during this time. Now, for better or worse, just like any empire, you have good you have good emperors, you have bad emperors, and the same is going to be true with popes. But as an infallible leader, it's very, very difficult to have doctrine pass on from year to year if it goes against something someone else's belief system. However, because they're in an effort to spread the word of God across from the Christian viewpoints, literacy rates go up incredible amounts like they had never had before, which allows a lot of science to be passed on, even though there's a couple of revolutions in there that basically say, you know, if anyone says anything scientific, we're going to chop their head off, namely the French Revolution. But I digress. All right. So then we get these secular nation states where there's these ideas, there's these thoughts, and we have all these viewpoints, but they're not linked. And so you can imagine sort of our roots as to why there is no uniform uh, system of measuring. Um, and I know you might argue what well, the metric system is. Yeah, but the United States doesn't use it. And it's because almost of these secular nation states. 
everyone sort of doing the same thing at different times and different rates all across the world at once is kind of causing a problem. And from 1600 to 1800, basically leading up to the Industrial Revolution, we start to have these national scientific academies form. Now they're very, very exclusive, which means if you don't come from a high birthing right or you don't have this incredible amount of wealth, you're not really included, which is a problem because now we can't share the information from year to year. We just have these rich, affluent people that have all the information and power sort of tucked to themselves at this point. And what happens is the church becomes fractured. And by the church, I mean, we're talking about the Roman Holy uh, Catholic Church. And so governments, not churches, start to fund and control innovation. That ends up being a good thing for science because now you can actually share thoughts and ideas without having the possible repercussion of having your um, being excommunicated or uh, worse, being put to death. And the big true change that happens for us is the Industrial Revolution into the early 19th century. And that is when all of this explodes, if you will, into all these different ideas. So as we talk about the universe or the cosmos evolution, you're going to see this starts with antiquity and sort of disappears and then is reborn and revitalized into the Industrial Revolution when we can have these advancements in modern technology. And so big thing for us in a simplistic term is this idea that the entirety of the known universe, all that is seeable and non-seeable even, started from a singularity of insurmountable or immeasurable density. So think the head of a pin with all of the mass of the known universe in one spot. And then for some reason, and we cannot say why for sure, it exploded and spread it outward. And in the first period of time in some of those videos, they talked about how fast this is expanding, how much energy is sitting inside of there. And as we go to 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang, that's our modern time. Now we're looking at this idea of, hey, the universe itself, it's different. It's bigger. There's a lot more to it than what we're seeing right now. And it starts to throw in some of our context of where we actually have been from this starting point. So to review kind of what has happened over the history of time in terms of human involvement, I like to chunk it into three main areas. So our first section is enormous. This entire blue section here is what I would call the philosophical era. And the philosophical era is basically the antiquity era. That's our logic and reasoning. Now, you have to keep in mind, with logic and reasoning, you're not going to actually do an experiment. And truthfully, in the times of ancient Greece and Rome, like, experimenting would be getting your hands dirty and almost what's considered slave labor. So you would not be doing experimentation. You would be talking. You would have forums. You would have discussions. You would have this idea of debate, debating for the better betterment of society, which is fine, except you're not going to look at any data to try and rebuke anything you have. So then the Middle Ages tends to be what we know as our alchemy era. And alchemy is uh, it's it's a kind of a wild notion and so all the secret societies that you can think of today usually have an origin in this era of the middle ages and you have to think that what they were trying to do was build off the logic and reasoning of the philosophical era but they had a really strong fascination with power and with money and with the idea that if i knew how everything was sort of coalesced in this known universe this higher thinking, I would have total control of civil civilization and development, society, and culture. Now, turns out most of the stuff from the alchemy era ends up not being so great because if I were to go to one of you in class and say, hey, guess what? Last night I figured out how to turn a lead block into gold. Most people will ask you today, okay, how do you do it? But in the Middle Ages, someone would just say, hey, can I have some gold? Now stop and think for a moment there. The person that says, hey, can I have some gold, is not a thinker. They're a taker. They just want what you have. And so there's no development of theory inside of that. Can I just have some gold is basically saying, I will rely on you to have all the knowledge, which is why the alchemy era does not prosper us in terms of scientific development that much. We are currently in what I like to call the modern era, and it's really, really small. Think Industrial Revolution to common to, to basically to 2020 right now, the common era, okay? That's a very short period of time. But the alchemy era does give us something good on accident. And what they do, because they're 
kind of screwing around a lot trying to make gold and find these secret elixirs that'll make them live forever is they essentially invent every piece of glassware and um, measuring device that you could ever imagine from our chemistry class once you go back face to face comes out of the alchemy era they get really really good at working with glassware and because they want to test each other because they want to figure out who's right and who's wrong they accidentally start doing measurement and they accidentally start picking up the one of the greatest tools of science which is replication because people eventually do find out these sorcerers and sorceresses that are claiming to have all this knowledge hey well then how do you do it and so we start actually scientifically replicating just to figure out what's happening but our focus ends up not being so much on what their gains are because a lot of it was shrouded in mysticism so this modern era this is where we're going to dive okay so I have this little link on here that we'll, I'll post on Classroom, but what I'd like to focus in on is when we talk the universe, there's something really weird you have to understand about the universe, and it's that all objects relative to you are traveling outward. And that makes sense if we're talking about the idea that the universe started with the Big Bang. Okay, but then where's the center? And when I was a kid and I first heard about this, this kind of blew my mind a little bit. So if you just pick an object, to be the center. So I just picked this random one right here. And I take this exact same image and I'm just gonna expand it from that object. Well, then it looks like everything in the orange location is now from the expansion. If you're standing on this object, it looks like you're the center of the universe because everything around you is expanding away from you. And when cosmologists actually first looked at this, they're like, whoa, you know, we are the center of the universe. So there's a problem with that. So if we picked a different object to be standing on and did the same thing, well, relative to that object, it still looks like everything is expanding around you. And the things that are further away are expanding faster than the things that are closer. So again, it looks like the people on this object are the center of the universe to their perception. But the people on this object think they're the center of the universe to their point of view. So then where is the center? And the real answer is there is no center or everything is the center. Because if you think we started at a singularity, well, a singularity means that all of matter and energy is stored in one location, think zero dimensions. And then everything inexplicably explodes and starts making the multiple dimensional universe that we live in today. Well, then everything has an origin of the center, which means we are the center and so is everything else in the universe, which is a very difficult thing to comprehend. So when we ask, where's the center of the universe, you simply have to say, you are, as is everything else around you. Okay, that's a little hard to take on here. So now let's focus in on this idea of expansion. And what happens is we have to look at light. And we know things are expanding around the universe because but once we start looking at spectral lines, you'll start to see that these various spectral lines or light are being stretched. So for example, if we had some green light that came off of a star, relative to Earth, and in one year it's shedding this green light towards us. Well, many million years later, since space is expanding, the red light will go towards us. And this is something that is a phenomenon known as red shifting. So if light shifts or be, is stretched to the redder part of the spectrum, what we end up seeing is that the object is traveling away from us. Um, you can think of it as an ambulance goes by you as well. It's called the Doppler effect. And it can happen with sound and it can happen with light. So as an ambulance comes really close to you, it's very, very high pitch because the sound waves are being smushed together. And as it goes away from you, it becomes more low pitched because the ambulance is traveling away from you. And the Doppler effect is something you will focus on in physics. For us, we just need to understand that red shifting means further away. Things are being stretched out from us. And so I need to talk a little bit about modern atomic theory or things that hopefully we had mentioned at some point in middle school, but maybe not, especially with COVID. And so if we start all the way into the Industrial Revolution or sort of where the modern time starts, the quote unquote father of modern chemistry is considered to be John Dalton. And Dalton kind of came up with this idea that, you know, matter is made up of various quantities. And he was focusing more on meteorology and the atmosphere and gases. And his data was highly suspect. And many think he plagiarized it from an Irish scientist. But all of this stuff, and regardless, with Dalton is that he comes up with that all matter is essentially just this sphere. There's an issue with that because Democritus in ancient Greek already had said this. Like he said this in the year 
uh, somewhere in the year like 300 BC. So, you know, I don't know, 2000 ish years, 3000 ish years ago, we look at this idea and nothing has changed from what the atom is. So, Democritus basically says this Imagine you have a boulder and you were to take that boulder and smash it into, you know, pebbles. Take the pebbles and you smash it into dust. Take the dust and you keep smashing it further and further and further. Eventually, you will get to some object that is so small you cannot smash it any further. It's indestructible. And the word for indestructible, indestructible in Greek is atomos. And atomos would be atom. So Democritus comes up with Dalton's idea almost 3,000 years before Dalton's even alive. Now, that's kind of mind-blowing because philosophical alchemy and then now into the modern era, this is what the atom was. And then everything happens back to back to back to back because technology advances. So in 1897, J.J. Thompson starts using something called a cathode ray tube, and he finds out there's an electron inside of an atom. And so he says, okay, I'm gonna just call this a plum pudding model. I don't know about you, but I don't know what plum pudding is because I'm not from Britain, um, from the 19th century. So we can talk about this more as a chocolate chip cookie dough model, where each of these electrons are little chocolate chips, and this dough on the outside is positive goo holding them in place. And it works for the most part. Everyone's like, okay, yeah, that's the negatives are sitting inside. There's the chocolate chips. We can clearly detect them. This is something we'll talk much more about later on. But furthermore, with Thomson's model, you now have the first subatomic or smaller than atom particle. So apparently atoms are not destructible. Sorry, Democritus, you're out. Well, Rutherford, who actually was a student of Thomson, because remember, in this modern civilization period, only the elite elites in these aristocratic societies are basically taking all this knowledge. Um, he actually takes this model and he starts shooting alpha particles at an atom. And he uses gold because gold is really, really dense. It's tightly packed. And because of gold's density, he's expecting when he shoots these alpha particles at this atom, they should just kind of fly through, maybe deflect a little bit, but he's shooting them so fast that they're not going to have time to interact with the electrons. And the positive goo is so spread out, it's just going to barely move. And what he finds is as he shoots these alpha particles, about 90% of them go straight through. And then every once in a while, one bounces off almost straight back at him. And he described it as if you were shooting a cannonball at a piece of tissue paper, and the cannonball bounced off the tissue paper and came back to you. That's how miraculous this was. And he basically coined this idea, well, hey, you know what? There's no positive goo. Instead, all the positivity in the atom is in the very center in this kernel of space that he called the nucleus, much like the cells, because at the time, biological discovery was happening around the exact same time as atomic discovery, which you'll learn about in ICB2. So we get rid of Thompson's plum pudding or chocolate chip cookie dough, and now we have the Rutherford planetary model. And so Bohr takes it one step further, and he finds out that as you ionize or you heat up or you send energy into atoms, they can actually emit these various types of colors called spectral lines. And the way this sort of happens is that we excite the electron up to a level by an input of energy. And as it falls back down, it's going to release some light. And the release of this light is indicative of how far away the energy levels were. So Bohr says, Rutherford, I'm with you on the nucleus, but the electrons are not orbiting exactly like the planets. They're in distinctive paths. And these paths, electrons cannot exist between because they would crash down to other paths and they would jump. And this is where it starts to get really complicated and it starts developing quantum physics because these electron jumps or orbits get even further into, hey, you know what? If we run the math, electrons can't even be doing what Bohr's talking about because if they did this, they'd fall into the nucleus and become destroyed. So we go even further into the quantum model, which we're going to save for a little bit later. We're going to focus right now on this Bohr model because truth be told, the Bohr model is actually a really solid model, even though it's wrong. And it's solid because it tells us how many electrons can exist on these rings. And actually, through most of ICB, we're going to use the Bohr model of the atom. And it's good enough, even though we know its limitations. And so I have this little animation that I'll show you to kind of explain spectral lines and what I'm talking about when I go from jumping up to jumping down. And so real quickly, we'll do that. Okay, so if we use the Bohr model of the atom, you can see that we have just the nucleus sitting in the center with, well, this is showing protons and neutrons, which we haven't got there just yet, but the electrons slowly orbiting around. And so what I can do is I can cause this electron to change orbits. So let's say I wanted to jump to the next orbit. I'd send some kind of light in and it'd be excited. 
Now, eventually, what will happen is if I want it to jump back down, which it will do on its own because it will want to reach the nucleus as close as possible, in order to make that jump, it would need to release its excess energy, which it does so in the form of light, and we get a spectral line. Now, the bigger the jump, the more powerful the energy. And so if we jump all the way from the spectral line, or sorry, if we jump all the way from the outer energy level to the first, we're going to release a lot of energy. And in some cases, that energy is in the purple or the ultraviolet or even past into like the X-rays, gamma rays, and what we can see. But some of these other jumps, like for example, if I was going to jump to orbit three and then just jump down to orbit two, we can see smaller jumps or less energy closer to the reds. And we get these individual pieces that are called spectrum or spectral lines. And the lines indicate all the possible jumps of every possible location that we can see in the visible light spectrum. Of course, keeping in mind the visible light spectrum is only a small portion of the spectrum because in truth, the visible light spectrum that we look at is only the tiny fraction of all the light that possibly exists. So spectral lines could go on further and further, but we have enough to identify atoms just by using these individual lines to tell them separate from one another. So now that we have a decent understanding of spectral lines, we can talk about, okay, well, how do we know, for example, that certain things are certain distances from us? So if we have a laboratory reference of, you know, some element in this case down here at the bottom, and we look at a nearby star, that exact same element, which we know is there because it has the same pattern of spectral line. And this is an absorption one, so it's a little bit different. But it shifted, and it shifted toward the red in the spectral lines, meaning this light, even though it has the exact same barcode or pattern, it's being stretched. Then we look at a nearby galaxy and we say, hey, it's the same pattern again, but now it's even further. And then a distant galaxy and a very distant galaxy, we still see the same pattern, but they're being shifted. And what you slowly start to develop is like, hey, everything I look at, depending on how far away it is, that's how much the light got shifted or stretched out. And so this red shifting indicates to us how far away certain things are from us from our perspective. And so we can start mapping out, well, where is the furthest known light? And that enters what we call the cosmic background radiation. And the cosmic background radiation is about 13.7 billion light years away, hence the origin of the 13.7 billion year start. Now, there's a lot more to it than just that, but the red shifting for us is very, very helpful. And then if we look further out in the known galaxies and the stars and everything that we can see, we end up finding out that most of the elements that exist are in huge quantities are hydrogen and helium. Which makes sense, because originally, if we start as a big bang and start forming matter, you're going to form the smallest pieces first. Well, then the smallest pieces are going to actually be built together to make the bigger pieces. So think Legos. If you dumped out all of your Legos all at once, the small pieces could be built into larger pieces, and the larger pieces could build into larger pieces. And so if we look at our periodic table, what we find out is hydrogen and helium are the biggest, abundant, most abundant elements in the known universe. And most stars are almost 100% hydrogen and helium. It's only as stars get bigger that they start making some other elements. And so then you're like, well, where'd the other elements come from? Well, some of those elements are actually really weird. Um, they happen from weird events that take place in the cosmos. For example, lithium, beryllium, and boron, those are only going to be formed by a cosmic ray or something in the, essentially annihilating a star along its pathway. Uh, or a piece of, or a large section of gas. The smaller stars like our sun can build up to things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, some neon, but we'll skip things like fluorine and we'll find out that, you know, odd number nucleons is actually kind of hard. But even small stars can't go much further than even sulfur. The very, very large stars can actually make things up to about iron and in some cases can make some of these other elements, just not in very large quantities. Iron is considered, specifically iron 55, is considered the most stable nucleon to exist. Sorry, iron 56, I lied about that. In iron 56, what will happen is as the star reaches a core of iron 56, it can no longer do nuclear fusion. And if it's no longer doing nuclear fusion, the star will cool off in the center and all of its warm material will sort of condense in on itself and explode. Well, that explosion is known as a supernova. And the supernova can make all kinds of elements. So these elements that exist from supernova are highlighted sort of in pink here. And even then, some of these other elements, and this is missing an entire row of elements at the bottom down here, we've made them ourselves. 
They're man-made elements, and you might ask yourself, well, why? Well, we had particle colliders, and we wanted to see stuff get bigger. So we did it. And we can make these elements that actually exist, I guess, if only for a moment in time. Although things like americium do have value, uh, it's in smoke detectors, it's still strange to think that there's an entire row of elements that are entirely synthetic, as we'll get further along. Now, our purpose is to basically understand here, we have primordial elements that exist from the Big Bang, namely hydrogen and helium, the first elements to actually show up. And so what we start to see happen over time is as the universe gets older, we make our first elements from the Big Bang. Those elements coalesce and make stars. Some of those stars explode into supernova, which make larger materials, which then make the second clusters of stars, which could then re-explode and make other stars or supernova. We start to see that the metal, metal acidity, or basically the amount of metal in the universe, increases over time. And it falls perfectly into line with the suggestion that the Big Bang started about 13.7 billion years ago. And you could run the calculation and see, well, how long would these stars last in supernova? How long would these stars last in supernova? And would it actually increase the metal level across the universe? And it falls almost exactly in line. Now, I say almost because there's a lot of in the universe we don't thoroughly understand, namely dark matter and dark energy. But we'll get there. So for our purposes of terms of stellar evolution, when a star starts forming, it's doing nuclear fusion inside of its core. It's turning hydrogen into helium. And all stars will basically ignites and crash gas inward, in this case for our sun, and you'll start turning the hydrogen into helium. Now, once you run out of hydrogen, what will happen is we'll start making helium fusion if you're big enough. And our sun is a medium-sized star. So we might start fusing a little bit of helium together. Well, then once the helium's gone, it's gonna cool off in the center. And as we've learned through convection, the warm material goes out, the cold material sinks. And so what happens is it crashes inward, and that's usually enough to re-jumpstart the helium fusion into carbon, if it's a large enough star. If it's not a large enough star, that crash inward is going to make the star sort of explode. Now, our sun's not going to explode. It's going to turn into what's known as a red giant. And that's when the core gets so cooled off relative to the star that essentially the outer ring of the star expands outward. And our sun is going to take up the size of about Earth's orbit in its dying days. Now that's several hundred million years away, so don't freak out just yet. But if it was a larger star, it could keep going. And we see this happen throughout the universe where we have, keep going to fusion all the way up to iron. And once we get to iron, you can't go any further. So scientists and astronomers come up with this generalized idea of, um, well, what kind of stars are out there? And what kind of stars are living and dying and dead? And what does that all mean? And so stellar development, as we see down here for really small things, all stars are going to start as protostars, or essentially big balls of gas that are kind of coalesced together. Now they crash inward on themselves due to gravity. Depending on how much crashes inward, that'll tell you what kind of star you make. And what we see in this spectral class, and this is called a hirschsprung russell diagram or an HR diagram, is we have the temperature of the star, we have what's known as the spectral class or the coloration of the star, and then on this right side, we have the luminosity, and on the left side, we have what's considered the absolute magnitude. Now, our sun is right in this main sequence here. And main sequence for us is what we talk about this idea of a living star. It's still actively doing fusion. And the ones that are in this main sequence that are very, very bright up here are the ones that are extremely large as well. And so they have an incredible amount of temperature. Now, as the stars start to die or run out of uh, their fuel source, you'll see their temperature decreases immensely. And they sort of eject from this main sequence out into what's known as the giant phase. And then once they're not no longer in the giant phase and they've expanded it, they get really, really small and really, really bright and become these things known as white dwarfs or sometimes brown dwarfs. White dwarfs are essentially the core of the leftover star. And so our particular sun will go through a protostar phase a living phase, which is the longest phase. Now I say living, it's not actually live, it's just doing fusion. When it runs out of a fuel source, it'll turn into a red giant, which will crash in on itself and make a planetary nebula. Once all of that ejects outward, the leftover core of that piece is known as a white dwarf. Now there's a variety of other things that could happen. Were our star a little bit bigger, we'd make a red giant or super giant. It could actually snowball outward and make something called a super blue giant which could then crash inward and make a supernova, leaving behind a neutron star. 
or it could be even larger and make a, a very, very large blue supergiant, which then crashes inward and makes a supernova, which could also crash inward itself and turn into a black hole. Now, these types of black holes that form are nowhere near as large as the ones that are in the center of galaxies. Now, with all that being said, it's like, okay, great, what do I have to know? Well, our focus is really about this idea of three major pieces. We know the universe is expanding because of the red shifting that we see. Okay. We know the relative abundances of elements suggest that the universe started from essentially no energy, or sorry, no matter, just almost pure energy because it made very small pieces first. And we can see that because hydrogen and helium are by far the most abundant elements that we know and see in the main universe. And then lastly, the cosmic background radiation tells us that this smoking gun sort of exists within our own known universe. The furthest light, the most stretched out light sitting in a microwave um, spectrum is sitting all around about 13.7 billion years away from, the, from our positioning. So the furthest we could see in the cosmic background indicates that at 13.7 billion years ago, the universe was very, very close together, extremely hot, and exploded outward, causing expansion. All right, that's it for that. Let's see if we can make some sense out of it.